Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want you to get your Bibles and if you will, turn with me to the book of Psalm 103. And then go over to Daniel. We're going to read Daniel chapter 2. We're going to talk about the priority of the kingdom of God. The entire motivation of God is his kingdom. Everything God is doing is motivated by his desire and his passion to have his kingdom established on earth. God already has a kingdom in heaven. Today we're going to hopefully learn, if we get to it, what a kingdom is. As a matter of fact, I think it's so important for us to study kingdom because the Bible is not a book about a republic. The Bible is not a democracy. The Bible is about kingdom. God's original purpose for creating the visible world was to establish his invisible kingdom on the visible world. That was his purpose for creation. So God's intent was to have his kingdom influence in the visible realm from the invisible. The invisible produced the visible. Please write that down. The invisible produced the visible. In other words, the visible world is not as real as the invisible world. The visible world is a reflection of the visible world. Keep writing. So whatever you see in the visible world has a corresponding reflection in the invisible world. Paul in his writings to the Corinthians says, we understand that the things which are seen came from those which are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but those that are unseen are eternal. That's why the invisible is more real than the visible. Because the visible is temporary. That's why it has to be sustained. God's plan was to have his invisible kingdom manifested in the visible world. Now his program is very interesting. The way God planned to do this is very clear in Genesis. He planned to do it by having invisible children. That's what the word image means. Children in his own image, his own likeness. When I use the word children, please don't get me wrong, I'm really talking about sons. And the word sons in the Hebrew is not really relegated to male. It simply means offspring. Something that springs off is called a son. So God calls all of us sons, whether we wear a male body or a female body, we are called a son. So a woman is a son of God. That means a woman happens to be the house, the gender house, but the woman on the inside is a spirit, and spirits have no gender. So the, the female is the house, but the spirit, the man, is a genderless spirit. That's why God calls us all man. Through these children, these sons called man, he intended to establish his visible kingdom. How's he going to do that? He got to give them a visible body, and then he made them a visible planet, and then he put them who are invisible, who are wearing a visible body, on the visible planet. And then he says, dominate that for me, have dominion. The word dominion means to govern, to rule, to control, to manage, to subdue. A kingdom 
is a realm over which a king has dominion or influence or control or management or administration. And that's what God wanted for you. So you and I were created by God to administrate his kingdom on earth. That's as simple as it is. Adam was an administrator. He was a steward. He was a manager of planet earth. And inside of Adam was everybody we see here today and all who are on the way. Adam was filled with everybody. So we are designed by God to dominate planet earth so that his king dominion could come to earth. Adam disobeyed God and forfeited his kingdom rights. He gave it over to an unemployed cherub called Satan. Satan has then since been havoc all over this world. I mean the guy has been ripping up God's beautiful program. And he's been doing it by using the kids even. Because he's contaminated their minds, he's depressed them, he has changed their concept of themselves. They don't even know who they are. As a matter of fact, the first thing that Adam felt when he fell was fear. He became what? Afraid of God himself. I mean, imagine the one whose image you are in, you become afraid of. What a tragedy. And of course, all of us became victims of that disobedience. We are now sons of disobedience. And then God sent the second Adam to come and correct the problem. His name is Jesus. What was the problem? Adam lost a kingdom. That was the problem. Adam did not lose heaven. So going to heaven is not God's objective for you. Heaven to me, uh, and according to the Bible, is a waiting place until the whole thing is consummated. But it's not your final destination. So if you die today, you would go to heaven. But you ain't going to stay there because that's not God's official, original plan for you. Heaven is real. There is a place that is called heaven, the place where God himself is ruler and king and lord. That's his territory. But the earth belongs to us. Psalm 115 verse 15 and 16. So ever since Adam fell, God's been working on a program in the same chapter when the fall took place to put man back in charge of the kingdom on earth. In uh, Genesis 3.15, God said to Satan, the woman shall have a seed and that seed shall come and crush your head. The word head means authority. He's going to take back the power you have and give it back to man. And in the process, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your authority and take back the power. That was the promise. And ever since Genesis 3.15, God has been working on this program to bring back the authority in the hands of mankind. His goal was to eventually do it himself through Jesus Christ. So all through the Old Testament, God was attempting to reintroduce man to his kingdom responsibility. Sitting next to you right now is a ruler. I have a, a series of tapes. One of them has been selling very well around the world. People have been ordering this tape all over the world. And I title it, The Kingdom of Ignorant Kings. And I did that because we, that's what we are. We are a whole kingdom of kings, but we are ignorant concerning who we are and what we are able to do and what our powers are, what our authority. In other words, the greatest enemy of man is ignorance. It's really not sin nor Satan. It's ignorance. What you don't know is killing you. So that's why God didn't send power to fix the earth. Because power is not our main problem. We got power. God sent a word to fix the earth. What is word? Knowledge. Christ came to give us the information of God or the revelation of God because we were suffering from ignorance, didn't know who we were and still don't know who we are in most cases. And so we are victims of our own ignorance. And let me tell you something. The word for ignorance in the Bible is the word darkness. And Satan is called what? The prince of darkness. It means he rules by ignorance. That means Satan has no power except your ignorance. Whatever you don't know is what he uses to destroy you. But the word for knowledge in the Bible is the word light. 
And Jesus is called what? The light of the world. It doesn't mean he's growing like a bulb. It means he came with information, with revelation. Why? Because that was our problem. We didn't know that we were kings. Didn't know this was our territory. We don't know that we are rulers on this place. That's why Satan is running our lives. He takes our bodies, destroys them with sickness, takes our lives and destroys them financially, destroys our marriages, messes up our kids, destroys everything we have, and because we don't realize the power we have. So when Jesus came, he came to give us revelation or information, not only about God, really, but about us. He came to tell us who we are. I put it this way. Jesus Christ came to the earth to introduce you to yourself and that's why he said follow me and I'll make you to become real men who know how to fish in life follow means what imitate observe learn watch I'm gonna demonstrate this thing what did he do he walks on the water he speaks to fish he speaks to a tree it dies he casts out demons with a word he, he points at things it happens I mean the guy will say hey that's how you do it. When he's walking on the water one time, Peter says, Can I come? He says, Of course. This is what men do on earth. Come on, boy. And Peter stepped up there and started walking on the water. He spoke to the tree. The tree died. The disciple says, Wow. He says, Wow what? If you speak to mountains, they'll move. You don't know who you are, he says. So the whole thing about the kingdom of God is the reintroduction of this kingdom. In the book of Daniel, real quickly, if you turn to this, we'll read this. Daniel knew about this kingdom. God gave him revelation. And Daniel 2.44 says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it will itself endure for how long? Forever. Daniel 7, verse 13 and 15 to 15, it says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man. Sounds familiar? Coming with the clouds of heaven. Clouds means host of angels. It doesn't mean he coming in that white stuff you see above there. Clouds of what? Heaven. That means the host of angels. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. The action of days is who? The Father God, the, 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 the Godhead. Who was led into his presence? The Son of Man. Who was that? Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And it says he was led to him and he was given what? Authority, glory, and sovereign power over all people. Now let me stress here, friends. And I could be here for another two weeks just teaching on this one chapter, this one verse. What's he called in that verse? The son of what? Man. Jesus adopted this statement, this title for himself. No one gave it to him. He adopted it by himself. He started telling the people, I am the son of man. He's he telling them, what you read about, that was me. Now, we call him the son of God. Why does he call himself the son of man? In John chapter 5, he gives a reason why. Can we turn there for a second? It's kingdom stuff here. Everybody say something's coming. Say it again, something's coming. In John chapter 5, Jesus was working a lot of miracles that day. He was healing people, cleansing people. He was opening blinded eyes. He healed a man at the pool of Siloam. I mean, he was doing a lot of miracles, and the people were impressed by what he did and he was doing it with so much ease they thought something about this guy we got to find out so they they actually asked him about his authority <laughs> look at if you will verse verse uh, 16 so because Jesus was doing these things plural many things on what the Sabbath day the Jews persecuted him Jesus said to them my father is always at work to this very day, and I, too, am working. By the way, uh, that statement is a dangerous statement. Uh, when is the father working? 
What? You sure? That's a dangerous statement. When is the father working? Are you sure? <laughs> when is the father working? Always. So how many times does he work? Always. So the father don't have a Sabbath day. I thought it said that God rested on the seventh day. What was their argument? The Sabbath. What was his answer? God's always working. Now we got a problem with the Sabbath here. Maybe we don't know what Sabbath means. They say, don't work on the Sabbath. He says, my father is always working. You mean Genesis chapter 2? We misunderstood it? When it says God worked six days and he rested on the seventh day? So on the seventh day he was still working? Maybe he changed his mode of work. <laughs> Maybe Shabbat doesn't mean to do nothing. Maybe Shabbat means to do a different kind of work, like enjoying what you worked for. My father's always working, he says. And therefore what? I got to work. So when are you supposed to work? As long as the father's working. When does the father work? Always working. <laughs> you know, when Christians go on vacation, they forget about God. They go to Disney World to visit a rat. So look, for six weeks, I mean for six days, I don't want to hear no Bible scripture. I don't want witness to nobody. I come to play with Mickey. That's how we think. But my father's what? Always working. He sent you to Disney World to bring somebody to Jesus. So the man, the cash register at Disney World is cashing up your, 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 your popcorn. And, and God says, tell him about him and my love. He said, now don't let's talk about that right now. I'm on vacation. He said, my father's always working. I was in the airport, Cincinnati, waiting for a flight. Walked up to get a bottle of water, and the lady across the counter recognized me. She said, you the man on TV? I said, yes, ma'am. She says, and she had three people who were serving before me, and she served them. And, uh, and she said, I'll get to you in a minute. And she served them first. And I said to myself, oh boy. So when I finish, when she finished serving them, she says, uh, what do you need? I said, I need some water. Is there anything else you need? She says, uh, I said, no. She says, can I buy you lunch? She, she run in the store. I said, well, if that's the case. <laughs> so I told her, she said, anything you want up there, you can get. So I ordered a sandwich and, and a, a bottle of juice. And she gave me this free. And while she's serving me, she says, you know, you know, I, I'm at the end of my wit. You know, I, I, I'm at the point where I'm about to commit suicide. This woman working in the airport. Suicidal. She says, and I told God today when I woke up, I said, God, if you don't give me a word this morning, today, I'm going to kill myself tonight. Found out that she was on drugs, trying to kick heroin. She was very skinny. Eyes were falling in. I mean, the girl was in a, in a terrible state. And she says, I, I'm so sick and tired of taking drugs. She, she said, this is my 19th job. She said, I told God I got to meet someone. You got to bring me some word today. She said, when I saw you, and I'm thinking, I got to catch a flight. I ain't got no time. And I heard the words, my father is always working. And do you know, the strangest thing happened. The strangest thing happened. This is in an airport. Thousands of people walking up and down. Do you know we stood there? I ministered to her, held her hands over the counter, prayed for her, took the lunch, gave her my card, and gave her scripture references. And all that time, no one came to the store. She said to me, she said, she said, did you notice no one came? I said, yeah. She said, but that's impossible. 
She said, you came to save my life. Tell your neighbor, God's always working. He's always working. My father's always working, Jesus said. And therefore, I must also work. But now watch his answers again with regards to the Son of Man. It says here, uh, <laughs> For this reason the Jews all the more tried to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself what? He could be God. Now, wait a minute. Didn't God say he's your father? See, in the Hebrew, if someone is your father, it means that you came from the same source. It means you are the same stuff. The Jewish theology did not have a fatherhood image of God. They were afraid of God. God was a consuming fire, a terror to them. And here comes this man in the flesh calling God my source. In other words, I and my father are the same stuff. They said, you cannot be God. Well, when you call God your father, you're saying that you are a little God. So they couldn't handle that. They tried to kill him. Well, look at this verse. Verse 10. Sorry, verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing of himself, but he can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. Everybody say, I'm a son. So I can do what my father does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, Yet to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. Now watch this. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to who? The son. That all may honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of who? 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 The Son of God. And those who hear will live. Now, the dead is going to hear whose voice? Not the Son of Man, the Son of God. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of what? Son of who? Son of who? Don't read this quickly. Jesus changes on us. When they talk about his omnipotence, the coming at the end of days with the trump of God to raise the dead. He says, when I show up that way, I'm the son of God. But he says, to judge on earth. To judge means to act righteously. These healings, these deliverances, these miracles. He says, I do them because I have the authority as who? The son of man. He says, I am only able to do these things not because I am the Son of God. Because as the Son of God, listen carefully, I am illegal. They said, how can you heal the sick, raise the dead on the Sabbath? He says, I do these things because... I am a man because only man can function on earth legally. Everything Jesus did on earth, he claimed it possible because he was the son of man. So when you read the Bible, you got to be careful every time he switches. When he talks about the future, he says the son of God. When he talks about the present, he says, the son of man. Why? Because to be here, you need a body. Hmm. Now, what does that mean to you? That means Christ had no advantage over you. Some of us think that because he was God in the flesh, that he was better 
or more equipped than us. No, he had the same stuff you get. He had the Holy Spirit. He had a body that could get tired. He had to rest one day, drink water, he got thirsty. He was tempted to quit. Oh, yes, he was. He wanted to find another way out of this thing. He went through the whole thing. Why? Because he was the son of man. And that he claims to be his source of authority. So you are authoritative on earth because you are a human son of man. Daniel said this in verse 14. He was given authority <laughs> and glory and sovereign power over who? All peoples and nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now why is this important? Where did he go? Read that. It says, he came into the presence of who? The ancient of days. Now I want you to picture this. The son of man. Oh Lord. When is this written? Long before Jesus comes to earth. Daniel had what? A vision of the future. He saw God's kingdom being established by a person called the Son of Man. And Daniel saw the Son of Man coming into the presence of the Ancient of Days to get some stuff. What he comes to get? Authority and the nature of God. Why? He's going to earth to have dominion over the peoples to bring back the authority of God. He has to go to God to get what? The authority. How did God give him the authority? By making him the son of man. Is anybody with me at all? That's in a powerful scripture. This is a couple of thousand years before Jesus came to earth. But Daniel saw him going to get a kingdom and the kingdom is already in heaven but to get it on earth he has to go as the son of man that's where he got his authority from and then he came and gave it to who every language and every people and that is why the next verse is so important watch this statement by daniel 7 18 it says but the saints of the most high will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever and forever and forever who's going to receive it not angels the saints are going to receive what the kingdom not heaven the kingdom the stuff he went in the presence of the angel of days to get he went to get it for the saints the word saint, write the word saint down please. The word saint has been really messed up lately. The word saint is not Saint Teresa, Saint Thomas More, and these dead people. Every book in the Bible that Paul wrote was addressed to the saints and they were all alive. You know, so don't let any philosophy cause you to believe that saints are only dead people. Every believer is supposed to be a saint. The word saint is from the word sanctified. Sanctified. Everybody say sanctified. sanctified. Now write it down. The word sanctified simply means set apart for a specific use. Put it another way. Sanctified means to be isolated for a specific purpose. So a saint. It's not somebody with a long robe and some veil on or something. A saint is anybody who was being set apart for a specific use. You can sanctify a cup. You can sanctify a table. You can set it apart for a specific use. Now some of you got your wedding china and they are sanctified. <laughs> what does that mean? Matter of fact, you don't even use them at all. They're set apart for guests. So they're sanctified, see? Well, that's what the word saint means. It means set apart. Now, every single person in this building who has received Christ into their lives, the Bible calls you church. Church is from the word ecclesia. Ecclesia means set apart, called out and set apart. So every believer is sanctified. So you are a saint. And they are the ones he gave what to? 
they receive the kingdom. You were born again, not to go to heaven, you were born again to receive a kingdom. What is kingdom? Dominion, authority, power. I mean rulership. You were created to be in charge of this situation. This week, praise God. When you wake up tomorrow morning, Monday, to go to work, don't go to work trying to scrape your way through life, barely making it by God's grace. Maybe it happened me through this week and maybe I'll just make it by Friday, maybe hanging on for Jesus. That ain't no kingdom mentality. Kingdom mentality is bring on the problems, bring on the trouble. Why? Me and King Jesus be ready for this thing. Why? I'm built to run this situation. Sanctify. He sent us to receive the kingdom of God. You know, this is, a, this is an incredible mentality change. Because if we believe that we, that's why most Christians are so frustratingly depressing. Being around them. Oh, Lord, help me. I mean, you see, the, you see these saints? I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to the one next to you. These people always complaining. I mean, one little water bill, Lord, I know how I'm going to pay this. I mean, what kind of king are you? Imagine if a king complaining about bills. Mentality. You know, all kings go to war. You all know that. Read history, man. They go to war. I mean, they go to war, they go to war to win. And they fight to the death. That's what kingship is all about. It's about protecting authority and taking territory. There's always an enemy somewhere around in your life. You got to take authority and get your territory back. It's a fight. You don't roll over and say, oh, Lord, take care of that. Mm -mm. You got to get this thing uh, out yourself. The Bible says the kingdom of God is what? Taken by the violent. You got to be violent to get this thing that's yours. Whatever is yours, you got to fight for. Say it with me. Whatever is mine, I got to fight for. Say it again. Whatever is mine, I got to fight Stop asking people to do things for you, man. Kings take authority and they take territory. Daniel says he gave it to the saints. The next verse. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven will be handed over to what? The saints. Now, I want you to underline a statement here in that verse in your Bible. It says, both the sovereignty, the power, and the greatness of the kingdom under heaven. Where is it? We want to go to heaven. He said, this kingdom I'm talking about ain't in heaven. It is under heaven. What I'm trying to do really before you die is to get you out of heaven. If I can just accomplish that much, if I can just get you out of heaven so you can start realizing, you know something? The planet is mine. God gives it to me as a steward. And then decide from this day forward I'm going to start taking back every piece of land my foot possess. I'm going to bring it under the influence of the kingdom of God. Think that way. That's what he says. He will give you the kingdom under heaven. And it will be handed over to who? The saints. A whole new verse. But here he is giving you the same instructions. And he will give it to the people of who? The most high. We keep wanting heaven. He says it's not about heaven. It's about the kingdom. We want to go somewhere. He said, no, the stuff I got for you coming to you. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you authority. Kingdom. So my thought patterns are very different than I used to have when I was a religious person. When I was religious, all I wanted to do was make it into heaven. Now as a saint, hallelujah, as a citizen, glory to God, all I want to do is to stay on earth. I want to make earth exactly what he said when you pray. He said, pray thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Not in heaven. When we leave here, people should know that there is a kingdom. In Acts chapter 8 verse 12 and 13, very powerful verse. Philip preached the kingdom of God. And I thought it was interesting that the Holy Spirit made sure these details were in this verse. 
You all remember when the black guy came from Africa, Ethiopia, in the book of Acts. He was an African guy, very wealthy guy. Uh, he was a, a eunuch. And he went up to Jerusalem to worship. Now remember that Solomon uh, had sex with the queen of Ethiopia. And she had a baby, remember? She got pregnant, went back home and got pregnant. And the message got back that Solomon got this child in Africa, but it's black woman. It's true history. And so, actually, one of her sons was the son of Solomon. Who's Solomon? King. Who is she? She's a queen. So who this baby is? The baby is a prince. So that in Africa, we have now an official, original child that belongs to Solomon and a queen. So now, therefore, the Hebrew people have African roots. This family in Ethiopia becomes the royal family connected to Solomon. That's why the Rastas got their ideas from. Now, the Rastas trying to make this boy Messiah. That's what they're trying to do. Now, ain't no record in scripture about this boy being no Messiah. Matter of fact, we ain't hear much with the boy after that. Keep the TV on. So you can't invent a Messiah for black people. But you see, when you were in slavery, oppressed, and you were disadvantaged and can't find food to eat, and then the European preacher, white Jesus, that was oppressing you, then I could understand your mental problems. I could understand why you say, well, that can't be the white Jesus for me, because the white Jesus sent the white man from Europe to oppress me and make me slave. So it got to be a black Messiah somewhere. And so you go looking for him, and you find him in Ethiopia, and you try to connect him to the Lion of Judah. There ain't no Lion of Judah connected to this boy. This is an illegitimate son that Solomon lay with this woman. I'm trying to show you where the, where, where, where the, 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 the unit comes from. This African man from Ethiopia is from that tribe, from that family, because they began to worship the God of Solomon. Remember, the Queen of Sheba was impressed by Solomon. And Solomon says, all I have is because of our God, Jehovah, Yahweh. And she says, I believe in your God. So she became convinced. And instead of worshiping those idols back home, she took God back home with her and told the family with the baby. And that must have been a sight. Eh? She came back home pregnant. Now keep in mind, by the time she got home, she showed him because it took months to get home in them days. So she got home pregnant. Now she couldn't even hide it. She got home big. And she was impressed with the God of Solomon. And that's why today, the first evangelistic outreach of the church took place in this chapter. This was the first international outreach by the church. It's this black man, where was he going? He was going back home to Africa. Where he been? The Bible says he went up to worship. Where? Because every Jew once a year had to go to Jerusalem to the temple to take a sacrifice and to worship Yahweh. That was the tradition. So the Africans from Ethiopia who were Solomon's descendants also did the tradition. They came up and they worshiped and went back home. This man is on his way back home. While he was in Jerusalem, praise God, somebody told him that a few weeks ago a man was preaching, healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons, cleansed the leper, and this man died on the cross, and this man changed the whole place and the Ethiopian trying to figure out who is this man. Now where's the Ethiopian? He's in the temple. He's worshiping Yahweh, and he hears the rumors about this man. He is reading, what is he reading? He is reading the book of Isaiah. Where did he get that from? He got it from his mama, or from the queen. The queen brought the scrolls back home from Solomon, and so now she, she has the scriptures back in Africa. By the way, that means the roots of African convictions in God go way back beyond slavery. They got the word before the Europeans. 
So here comes this guy, he's reading. And by the way, black people couldn't read. Anyhow, so he's reading. And the Bible says, and guess what? Black people was rich. He was riding in a chariot reading, which means that he wasn't driving. Come on, man, clap. That's a good place to clap. The Bible says he was reading in his chariot on his way back to Ethiopia. And while he's reading, he got to a place in Isaiah where it says he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. And he's reading this point and he got confused and couldn't figure out who was this talking about. And the Bible says while he was pondering this in his mind, Philip was in a revival in a small town, and while in the middle of the revival, people getting healed and saved, the Holy Ghost came, and this is where a miracle starts. It says, it translated Philip. Took him out of the revival. I know how that happened. He just vanished. Where's the preacher? The preacher was here just now. The Bible said, Philip was taken up by the Holy Ghost and translated, transported, and he came alongside the chariot. Could you imagine you reading? This guy appeared just jogging behind. Hi, right, what you reading? <laughs> and so the Bible said that chapter is a good chapter to read. Interesting chapter. Got to make a movie of that one day. And he asked the guy, he just, he just asked the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian said to him, Who are you? He says, I'm Philip. And he says, What are you reading? He, and he got, the Ethiopian says, I'm reading this Isaiah, but I don't understand it. And the Bible says, Philip said unto him, would you like to understand? Understand this thou without readers? And he says, no, I don't understand. I read it, but I don't understand it. It sounds like a lot of us are reading it, but don't understand it. And here's what Philip says. But when they believe, Philip, as he preached the good news, the kingdom of God, that's the Ethiopian and his, and his colleagues there who were with him, it says, in the name of Jesus, they were to be baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now, he preached the good news of what? That's what I want you to watch. What did he preach? He preached the kingdom. What have we been preaching? We've been preaching salvation, healing, prosperity, Solomon, heritage. God, the message of the kingdom. What have we got? Philip knew the gospel. The gospel was the gospel of the kingdom and that's what he preached. He didn't preach born again. He preached the kingdom to these people. That's why I wanted to just stress some points here. The purpose of Jesus is the same. What was his, what was his original purpose? His intent was to reinstate the kingdom of heaven on earth. Something interesting I want to wrap up this session on because next week we're going to go a little heavy into this. But the timing of his coming was related to the kingdom. Not only did he preach the kingdom, but even the timing of his coming to earth was controlled by the kingdom message. His ministry's message was related to the kingdom. That's all he preached. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. And then the promise of his ministry was related to the kingdom. He said that when I come, the kingdom shall be established in its fullness. Very interesting. And then his future expectation was not heaven. But he expected the kingdom to be established. All right. As you write those notes down, let me just wrap this up on this unique and very important point of timing. Timing. Help me, Lord. Okay, listen carefully. How many of you have studied communication in school? Can I see a hand in college? Communication? Okay, some of you can. Okay. What's the first thing they teach you about? Communication in school, in your communications class. What do they, they teach you? What is it? 
effective communication needs what? You got the sender and the receiver. True? Okay. And then you, what you got in the middle? What they call noise. Right? So if I got to give you a message, listen carefully now. In communication, they say, I am the sender. I got the message. You are the receiver. I got to get it to you. Now, between me and you is a whole lot of thing they call noise. Noise is people getting up, walking around, distracting you. You know, something bites you on your foot, a mosquito or something. You know, maybe somebody make a loud sound or whatever. Uh, a baby cries. I mean, there's a lot of noise that can interrupt my message. So you miss it. Secondly, they say that for communication to be, su to be successful, you need what they call, ready for this? You need to have what they call understanding or definition of terms. Follow me carefully. In other words, if I'm going to communicate to you anything, the words I use, whatever my definitions are, they got to be yours too. Are you with me? Otherwise, we can't communicate. For example, if I said, give me some bread. Now, in 1960s, I'd give you money. See the problem? So if I says, give me some bread, so I give you some money. Because in the 60s, that's what money was. Money was bread, all right? Remember that? Bread. Okay? If I say, hey, man, that's cool. Now, it doesn't mean it's cold. Now, in the 1950s, that means you're shivering. But in the 1970s, it means that you're okay. See? Two different meanings, same word. Okay? How about this one? Chill. Now, in the 1980s, chill meant what? Be cool. In the 1950s, it means what? Reason. Same word. In other words, communication is only successful if the words we are using mean the same thing. All of this now, don't, very important here. So here is God with a whole planet of people. He's in heaven. He's got this message that's important to them about who they are as a kingdom. He sends himself in a body. Now, chronologically speaking, in this Bible, how long ago did Adam sin? Chronologically, 6,000 years ago, okay? Not the evolutionist dates. We're talking about the Bible. 6,000 years ago, Adam sinned, according to this book. When Adam sinned, the same chapter, God promised to send the seed. In the same chapter. So, when Adam sinned, in verse 4, in verse 15, God says, got it covered, no problem, seed's coming, take care of business. So God sends the solution in the same chapter. But, how long did God take before he showed up? So now you get Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Then there's Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. Then there's Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Then there's a blank page. Now, all of those books, all that history, thousands of years, God still ain't sent the Son. What's God waiting for? Well, you study the whole book, you can see why God didn't send him. Right after Adam sinned, you got Noah. You know what Noah did? Noah got drunk. Alcoholic fella, right? God said, no, can't use that time. Then his sons, they went off into all kind of weird stuff. Right? And they went to all kind of demon worship. I mean, Noah's sons went into all kind of mess. And out of that comes this guy God found called Abraham. Abraham is Noah's great, great, great grandson. So God comes to this little village where they worship the moon. That's how bad Noah's sons came out. They were worshiping the moon. The land of Ur is where, Mo, is where Abraham lived. And his fathers worshipped the moon. And he went in there 
and he says, come here. And he called Abraham out. Abraham comes out. He says, now Abraham, I don't have no, <laughs> there's no model on earth for my message. So I want you to start something for me. Through you, I'm going to create a nation. Abraham says, fine, but I ain't got no children. God said, no problem, we work on that. Abraham said, but I'm 75. God said, we work on that too. We got Viagra. Uh, 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 uh. I just thought I'd throw it in for you guys who need help. <laughs> so, God works a miracle, and age 100, Sarah has a baby. His name is Isaac. God still ain't got a model for the kingdom. Isaac has two sons, Isaac and Esau and Jacob. He says, Jacob, I'm going to change your name to Israel. So through Israel, has 12 sons, these have come to 12 tribes of Israel. God says, fine. He's going to tell you what I want to do. Watch God now. God says, I'm going to try to set this model up. Listen carefully. He says, look, you will be my people and I'll be your God. Got it? Good. So tell you what, there'll be no one between us. It'll be the people and God. God never wanted a king. He why? He says, I will be your king. You will be my kingdom. That's all God wanted. He says, now tell you what. I'm going to organize a situation where you guys will have communion with me through this worship thing. I'll come to you. I'll talk to you. You'll do what I say. Bring the nations back to me. Got it? Good. So the people says, fine. They got out there. And they began to realize we can't see God. And then these other nations got kings they could see. So when they met the other nations, the nation would say, are you a nation? They'd say, oh, yes, we are the tribes of Israel. But who's your king? God, where is he? Somewhere around here. I mean, how do you tell folks that your government is somewhere around here? That became tough for them. So they began to ask God, give us a king that we could see. God says, you don't want a king. That ain't the model. They said, give us a king. He says, look, the model, we're working on the model now. I am the king. You are the kings. This is the kingdom. Get it? You don't want a king. They said, we want a king. We want a king. We want a king. So they got real upset at God. And the Bible says, God says, okay, if you want a king, choose from among yourselves one, and I will bless him. So they chose Saul to be their king. So now God has the king in the middle of the king. Representing the kings to the king. The model still ain't right. So God says, okay, tell you what. This king going to give you taxes. God's trying to set it up now. He can take taxes from you. That's your tithes. He can put your kids in, in war and armies. Okay, that's the angels. And he's going to levy you for your land. He can take property taxes. I mean, God lists all these things. And these people said, look, you get a ruler, he's going he to wipe you out. They said, we still want a king. So they got Saul. We know the story of Saul. Saul obeyed God until one day he decided he liked mutton too much. Remember that guy? He saw them sheep. He said, whoo, can't kill them. So he kept these sheep, these sheep, and he took them back home. And when, when God said, I told you to kill the sheep. He said, I kill him. He said, but I heard the sheep bleeding. He said, that's right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't know. Interesting story about Saul. So the, so the prophet comes, Simon said, Saul, why did you disobey God? It's more important to obey God than to worship. And Saul says, oh boy, ask God to forgive me. He said, God can't forgive you no more because you break the law. And then God chose another one named David to take his place. David becomes king. Now David is a good fella. David is now raised by God to try to get the model. What's God looking for? A model to create a kingdom so he could preach a message to the nations. David says, the Lord is my God, and my people shall be his people, and he shall be my God. God said, we're getting close. And then David became a mystery. God says, David, I want you to be a king and a priest. So David wrote worship psalms, but he also was an administrator. He wrote the largest book in the Bible, the book of Psalms. He was a king, but yet he was a worshiper. God says, this is good. It's close. Wonderful. But still ain't got it, because now David can commit adultery. Mess things up. What happened? The kingdom is split in half after David is, is, is killed. The people divide. God says, oh, the model is gone. Now the people are scattered into 
Babylon, they are all messed up. And then Daniel starts getting information. Daniel says, look, the kingdom is still around. God has a kingdom idea. He's going to bring this kingdom, give it to the saints. We get the story. Jesus still ain't come. He goes into Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. The people are there now under burdens. So they went to Pharaoh. They went to, to the Babylonians. They were under the Assyrians. They were under the Chaldeans. They were under oppression. I mean, every single generation under oppression. God said, I got a problem here. And guess what? When the Babylonians finished, then the Assyrians took them, made them slaves. Then they went into the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the, and the Moabites, and all the other ites, and the Canaanites. And they became slaves to everybody. Then the Greeks came. And the Greeks began with philosophy. These are thinkers. And they used their philosophy to win the whole world, man. The Greeks could talk you out of everything. That was their gift. They were philosophers. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. I mean, that's where they came from. The line of Greeks. The Greeks were thinkers. And they ran the whole of Europe because of their philosophy. Keep following me quickly. The, the Greeks ruled for many, many years. And then there came another empire known as the Roman Empire. Now God's getting excited. Because now this is the first empire in history who takes a model and sets it up. And the model is exactly like the kingdom of God. The Romans are the only empire that sets up an administration that resembles the kingdom of God. How did they do it? Listen carefully, quickly. The Romans were the only ones who would invade a country, but they wouldn't remove the people. They would take over a country, they would leave the people in the land. Now, every other empire before that did the opposite. The Babylonians, the Syrians, all those nations that came in, they would take the land and the people. Take the people out of the land, take them back as spoil, and put them in their land and make them slaves to them. Every empire did that. That's why the the Jews were in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. He took them out of Palestine, brought them into Babylon, and made them slaves. But the Romans were the first ones who did the opposite. They would come into a nation, take the nation, take control, but they wouldn't take the people out. They would leave the people in the land, but they did something strange. They would then go back to Rome, they would choose a governor, send him to that place that they took over. And that governor came from Rome. He was a Roman. And he came to that area, and his job was to govern that area and turn that area into Rome. Am I clear? That's the difference between the Romans and every other empire. That's why the Romans took over the largest piece of property of earth. They became the greatest empire in history. Why? They had a system that worked. The system was you take over and you send someone to run it and leave the people there and turn the people into Romans. That's why we get the statement, when in Rome. Okay, and what that means is, look, anytime you go into a Roman territory, you got to act like who? A Roman otherwise they will kill you so when a Roman took over territory the territory became Rome guess what the Bible says in Galatians 3 in the fullness of time God sent forth his son born of a woman fullness of time doesn't mean time on the clock it means timing of situation why did God wait till the Romans were in power before he sent Jesus because the model for the kingdom was perfect and therefore, the definitions of words were right. Am I making sense? This is good stuff, man. You guys got to get this. So when you study the Roman Empire, you really study in the kingdom of God. For example, Caesar is not a name. Caesar is a title. And it means Lord. The Romans established a word called ecclesia. That's a Roman word. 
and it means church. Caesar had a church. What is church? That's the Senate. That's the group that ran the empire. They were called Ecclesia Church. You all talk to me, man. I can finish right now. We got to get this. The next one. The governor, for example, Pilate was a governor. The governor never spoke for himself. He only spoke when Caesar told him to speak. Next. The governor had the same power of Caesar. He can let you live or let you die. So we find this problem. We got a kingdom just like it. Now every citizen in this empire are called subjects of Rome or they are called property of Rome. Are you with me? There was no other lord in the Roman Empire. When the when Romans took over, there were lords all over the place. Hey, well, little lords, little lords. But when Roman took over a territory, they canceled all lords. And there's only one lord. Who's that lord? Caesar. And so therefore, when they start to talk about Jesus Christ coming to the town, remember what he said? He says, I am lord. And they said, we have no lord but Caesar. In other words, you are causing insurrection. You are now challenging the empire of Caesar. You are now committing what? Treason against the state. And that's why Christ was tried. Pilate says, look, come before me. Oh, what was the trial? Pilate's trial had nothing to do with religion. So don't blame Pilate. Pilate's trial was what? You say you're the king. We got a problem here. If you're the king, you're putting me in trouble because you see, Caesar can ask me what's going on in my territory. They got another king down there and I kill you if you say you're king because you're putting my job in trouble. Now you understand Pilate's problem? So Pilate says, are you king? Christ says, you say so. In other words, Christ is trying to save his head and his job. What, what was the complaint? They said, there's a man in the street, Pilate, and they are calling him Lord. Pilate says, Lord? Oh dear. Tell him, come. And he says, are you a Lord? Do you own people? Only Caesar owns people. When they say taxes, Christ says, oh, taxes, no problem. Uh, give me a coin. They gave him a coin. He says, whose head is on that? They said, the Lord. He says, good. Then give to that Lord what is his. See, it was a kingdom argument. So God sent Jesus at the right time when every word that he speaks could be understood. Clap your hands. We'll pick up here next week. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.